In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to implement Swagger in a .NET C Sharp Razor project. Swagger does a couple of really neat things for us. First of all, it can generate a schema that describes our API endpoint or endpoints in the OpenAPI 3.01 version framework. So you see, this is effectively JSON that describes JSON. It's a machine readable file that can tell us what our JSON endpoints look like. And that's great because there are many times we want to have this machine readable schema of our endpoints. There are many uses for that, especially if we are consuming somebody else's JSON or we want our JSON to be consumed. But it also gives us something else really cool, which is this more human readable API documentation that looks, you know, like a typical web page. And we have our definition up here, our version information, a bit of information up here that we can talk about. Uh, and then we also have a description of all of the endpoints and even better, an ability to try them out and look at the values that they return. So here's a get endpoint that's showing uh, essentially all of the specimens that my endpoint can return. Uh, then we also have a post, which is where we can create a specimen. And then we have a get endpoint where we can specify an ID or a specific specimen that we want to have returned. And we can try that one out. And again, get our response. A really nice way to kind of add a test harness or even just a try it out harness to our applications. And then put and delete. Uh, these are a couple of other HTTP actions that are frequently used in a JSON RESTful service. To do this, I'm using the Swashbuckle ASP.NET Core library, and I will say that I borrowed a lot of their documentation, tried it out, and then enhanced it a bit myself. So I want to give full credit for them because you'll see that a lot of my demo here came straight from their documentation, plus integrated into my project with a few other enhancements. If we've not done so already, we'll need to manage our Nugget packages and add our Swashbuckle Core. Uh, ASP.NET Core class. So simply go up to our project, right click, and choose uh, Manage Nugget Packages. And this interface will come up. Now I have already installed it uh, as I was working through this demo, but swashbuckle.aspnet core is what we want to have installed. So if you've not, in, if you have installed it, you'll see it here under installed. If you've not installed it, uh, go to browse and simply enter swashbuckle ASP.NET Core. Okay, here we go. Uh, you notice mine actually has a little X up here indicating it's already installed and I could remove it if I want. If I hadn't installed it, we'd see an arrow like this. And you'll also see several uh, items with similar names, but the only one you need for our example is that swashbuckle.aspnet core. Install that and then you're ready to go. Next, we need to register Swagger with our application, which is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, we simply go to our program CS file. You might remember this in a previous video when I was adding a controller to our project, and we want to make sure our controller is still there because Swagger is going to look for the controller. So for the controller, we're going to need these two lines, uh, Builder Services Add Controllers and Builder Services Add Endpoints API Explorer, and also this app.mapcontrollerroute. So in, in, I know I didn't cover those in this video. I covered those in the previous one. If, you, if you're not familiar with those, I'll just point you to the video where I talk about uh, adding a controller to a C-sharp Razor project. So just a couple more things we need to add here. First of all, one more service. And we'll say add Swagger Gen. Then if it's in debug mode, we want to be able to show the Swagger UI. It's easy enough to check for debug mode or development mode by doing an if test like this if app environment is development. And simply add these two lines, app, use Swagger, app, use Swagger UI. And at this point, we're ready to deploy and take an initial look at our Swagger environment. Now with Swagger configured, I've deployed my application and I can view the Swagger UI simply by going to the uh, root local host and then the port number and then slash Swagger. And it brings up this documentation automatically. One cool thing is it also lets us see the JSON file that was generated. And this JSON file is effectively describing our API endpoints. And that's handy if we want to consume it uh, by another computer or even if we just want to take a look at that configuration. But if we want to look at it as humans, we can use this fancy Swagger user interface, which shows us the HTTP actions that we can invoke here. So 
get is usually to read something, post to create something, put to update something, delete to delete something. These are HTTP actions that have existed for a long time, but they're ones that we are able to reuse when we're using our RESTful JSON services. So get, let's see if I expand this one. Uh, okay, no parameters required because this is a get that's just going to return everything to us. So I can say try it out, execute. And then we see a list of all of the specimens that my controller is making available to me. Now I'll grab just one of these. We'll say uh, dwarf, dwarf crested iris because I know I'm going to need that in just a minute. So we go down to our post and notice that our post is giving us an example request body based on what it sees the schema looking like. And no surprise, this looks a lot like one of our specimens. So I click try it out and I can go ahead and paste in that specimen JSON that I got from the Git and I can choose execute. And nothing crazy is going to happen here because we didn't do any implementation on the server side beyond just receiving this message. But you see, it does return to us at 200, which is success. Now the get down here is a bit more interesting than the get we saw up above because the get down below allows us to specify a number which is captured in that curly ID close curly. And that says, okay, give me just the item at this location. So if we go up and uh, take a look at our JSON here, we see element zero, element one, element two is a cumulus service berry. So if I go down to my get and I just pick say element number two, It should return to us only one element, and that is, sure enough, the cumulus service berry. I could try it again with a much higher number, say 12, and that should give us a different plant. Sure enough, the Calicanthus floridus or Carolina allspice. Now we keep going and we'll see that we have the put. Uh, put, we need both an ID and a, uh, and a request body, which represents the JSON we want to put somewhere. So put is typically an update operation. There again, we're dealing with read-only data here, so we should probably get back a 200, but it's not actually going to change anything in our feed. Then for a delete, a delete, we don't need to provide it any JSON, really. We just need to tell it the item to delete, which in our case, I'm just going to say number five. Uh, but there again, we know it's not actually going to delete anything. It could. That's just beyond the scope of this video. My controller is simply receiving the put, uh, the, the, the post, the put, and the delete, not doing anything with it. But uh, nonetheless, that will give you an idea of what this user interface will look like. This gets really handy, especially when you get very large collections of endpoints and you want to remember which is which. It's common to generate this kind of swagger doc and then make it available to an entire enterprise on you know, an intranet site or something like that, or even uh, if it's a public, publicly accessible API, make it available somewhere on the internet. I've placed several breakpoints inside of our controller so that we can take a look at what happens when we hit the Swagger UI. So I start with our get API values. I didn't put a breakpoint on this one, but nonetheless, we can see that sure enough, we get several records back. I take a look, zero, one, two. We see that two is the Cumulus Service Berry. So now I'm going to go to the get that accepts an ID give it ID of two, and we notice that my breakpoint hits, and it says, okay, out of this collection of specimens, I'm going to get uh, item number two. We'll go ahead and tell it to continue. When we look back on our page, we see, sure enough, it has returned a single item, the Cumulus Service Berry. Of course, if I said three or four or something else, uh, we would get a different record back. Item number five gives us the Allegheny Service Berry. So it's alphabetical order. No surprise, it's Allegheny Service Berry. Uh, but nonetheless, we do see it is a different Amelanchy or a different plant. Now, I can take this response body and I can throw it into our post method or something else. I could put it into the put method as well. And we see that sure enough, our post is going to stop. And let's take a look at the value. I just put a silly console write line in there. I'm going to take that out because I don't like console write lines. But nonetheless, you see, sure enough, it's this Allegheny service berry that I just pasted in. But the benefit is it's not just looking at it as straight up text. It's looking at it as an actual object. So you see it's marshaled it from that JSON string into a specimen object. And now as an object, we can program against it. Of course, this will continue to work if I look at some of the other endpoints like uh, delete and put. Now, put is saying, you know, let's replace this item at this location. So for that, we need both an ID. I could say number five. And we also need uh, some type of JSON data. 
execute and you see there we're going to have our value which is going to be this Allegheny service berry once again and the ID is the location where we want to put it and it's five which is what we specified uh, no big surprise if I continue this and I go down to our final endpoint which is delete and we know put and delete we and post actually we haven't given a full implementation beyond the controller but nonetheless uh, we can at least see how we can enter that controller and uh, we can do more programming from there. So the delete, I put in five, I put in execute, and uh, looks like it just came back, you know, came back with nothing. I don't think I actually put a breakpoint there, which is uh, why that one came back so quickly. Now we see that our Swagger UI is indeed very useful and very functional and very user-friendly for testing out our endpoints, but it is generated. And what if we wanted to add a little bit of special documentation up here? Well, we do have an opportunity to do that. And where we want to go is this line add swagger gen within our program CS. And we can give this a, a bit more intelligence. Within our Lambda, we have options.swagger doc. We're giving it a version of v1, and then we're giving it some open API info. We're saying version v1, title specimens API. Description, a web service that shows specimens that are thirsty at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. And then a link for our privacy policy, and we could have terms of service in there as well. Uh, several more things we can describe here. As a matter of fact, we could make this description a little bit more verbose, but this will give us what we need. So note, when I reload, we see some things we didn't see before. Uh, we see a version V1. We see the description. Uh, a web service that shows specimens that are thirsty at Cincinnati Zoo and Botan Botanical Garden. We also see a title, Specimens API, and we see a link to the terms of service here, just like so. So, I hope this video on Swagger Doc has been helpful. It's a really easy way to give documentation to your JSON APIs and also a really easy way to test them out. As always, I hope you found this video helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.